Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome members of the public, staff, and others who are joining us today for our first virtual PED Talks event entitled The Rules of Engagement, Museums, Their Artifacts, and Their Audiences. My name is Sylvia Sadowski, and I work as a Strategic and Business Planning Advisor for the City of Hamilton, and I will be your moderator for today. Before we begin, I'd like to start with the Land Acknowledgement Statement. The City of Hamilton is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wandot, Odenoshone, and Mississaugas. The land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampon Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Odenoshone and Aninishine Bay to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase, 1792, between the Crown and the Mississaugas of Credit First Nation. Today, the City of Hamilton is home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, North America, and we recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history of this land so that we can better understand our roles as residents, neighbours, partners, and care care caretakers. A couple of notes about today's session. The session will be recorded and all cameras and microphones have been turned off except for the panelists. At the end of the presentation, there will be a question and answer period. As audience participants, you can email your questions throughout the session as well as after the presentation to pedtalks at hamilton.ca and we'll do our best to answer as many of, of your questions as possible. So once again, that's pedtalks at hamilton.ca. So today I'd like to welcome John Summers, who will be discussing the evolution of museums, what they have meant in the past, their meaning today, and moving forward, a vision of what they could mean in the future and what this could mean to our Hamilton Civic Museums. But first, it's my pleasure to welcome Jason Thorne, General Manager of the Planning and Economic Development Department for the City of Hamilton, for some opening remarks and to introduce our keynote speaker, John Summers. Over to you, Jason. Great, thanks very much, Sylvia. And, uh, and Sylvia, thanks for pulling this, this session together. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Sylvia said, my name is Jason Thorne. I'm the head of the Planning and Economic Development Department. And we've been hosting these uh, PED Talk events for, um, I guess, something like five years now. We do two or three a year. We've covered a wide range of topics, really exploring different types of issues that are facing the city of Hamilton uh, as, as we grow and develop. And uh, we typically have a, have a good mix of participants and, and this afternoon's no exemption of city staff, uh, as well as members of the public uh, taking part in kind of uh, learning and having the conversation together. Uh, we've covered a lot of uh, topics in the past. We've talked about uh, we've talked about Hamilton as a music city. We've talked about H Hamilton as a as a wel welcoming city for 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 immigrants and new Canadians. We've talked about Hamilton as a cycling city, about green design and passive house uh, development, about public art, and and a whole wide range of of other topics. Uh, and I hope that uh, people will enjoy today's topic uh, as much as they have the previous sessions. And our speaker uh, today is John Summers, uh, who, who for some of you may be a bit of a new face to the city of Hamilton. Um, he is the manager of Heritage Resource Management in the Tourism and Culture Division. Uh, since John graduated from the University of Toronto uh, with a Master of Museum Studies degree, he's worked as a supervisor of domestic interpretation at Fort York uh, National Historic Site, curator of the Marine Museum of Upper Canada, curator of the International Yacht Restoration School in Newport, Rhode Island, Chief Curator of the Antique Boat Museum in Clayton, New York, General Manager of the Canadian Canoe Museum, uh, and most recently, Manager of Heritage Services for the Regional Municipality of Halton. Uh, he's also a, a speaker and an adjunct lecturer at the University of Toronto's Museum Studies Program, and he's the co-course director for the Exhibit Planning and Design and Education and Public Programs courses um, offered in the Ontario Museum Association Certificate in Museum Studies. And he's also an author. His 2018 book uh, is Creating Exhibits That Engage, a manual for museums and historical organizations, and it received an award of excellence in the publications from the Ontario Museum Association and an award for outstanding achievement uh, in research and cultural heritage from the Canadian Museums Association. Uh, 
And notwithstanding that very impressive uh, uh, background and bio, uh, his career peak hit a high about approximately six or seven months ago uh, when, he, when he joined the city of Hamilton to take over as the, uh, the manager of heritage resource management. So uh, we've been really lucky to have him here at the city um, as a new face in our department and in, the, in, our, in our corporation. And, uh, and welcome, John, for your, uh, your trial by fire to be our first host of a uh, virtual TED Talk. And thanks for taking this on. Uh, is this just intended to make COVID look like not a problem? <laughs> this, is, this is the real trial by fire? Yes. I'm just going to share my screen. Oops, excuse me. There. And Sylvia, are we looking good? Looks great, John. Okay, thank you. Um, so thank you, Jason, for that um, fulsome introduction. Uh, sometimes um, I package all that as a series of progressively responsible positions. In other cases, um, it makes it look like I can't keep a job. Um, I'll let you decide which one you prefer. Um, I wanted to talk this afternoon about things that are going on um, outside the walls of the museums of Hamilton and what they might have to do with what's going on inside the walls of the museums in Hamilton. Um, normally, I would start a talk like this by saying uh, it's great to be here and I look forward to talking with you. Um, these days, uh, I'm not sure, probably like many of you, I'm not sure exactly where he here is. So <laughs> I am virtually here um, and I'm really looking forward to um, taking a little trip with you in the next 40 minutes or so. So as Jason noted in his intro, these PED talks are about ideas and insights. And I would like to do for you the museum version of those ideas and insights. So I'm just going to um, get started here. And I've divided the presentation according to the subtitle. So we're going to look at museums and then artifacts and then audiences. So we will start with museums, part one. Um, and I'm going to start with a Captain Obvious question, uh, and that Captain Obvious question is, what is a museum? And if you were to ask people on the street what that brings to mind, and I have actually done this, um, these are real answers. Big building, grand entrance, full of stuff, field trips, dinosaurs, gift shop. Uh, those are all classic attributes of museums, uh, and in fact, that's probably the kind of museum experience that is suggested by the Hamilton Civic Museum's logo, which has just appeared in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, too. The left-hand shot is actually of the British Museum, which has all of those things and more. So if we ask that question, what is a museum? Normally, when you ask a question that big, you would look for a definition, right? You would either open the dictionary or an encyclopedia or go online. Uh, you could also ask the International Council on Museums, a very august body that's run by um, the UN and UNESCO. So according to them, a museum is a nonprofit permanent institution in the service of society and its development, open to the public, which acquires, conserves, researches, communicates, and exhibits the tangible and intangible heritage of humanity and its environment for the purposes of education, study, and enjoyment. This has been in use as a definition for uh, almost 50 years now, and it shows up in the uh, mission statements uh, and policies of many organizations. They've just adopted this uh, wholesale. It's a perfectly good definition. Uh, I always think it has a very earnest, solid, uh, Victorian, self-improving sort of feeling to it because the museum is permanent, so it must be a serious place, whatever permanent really means in this context. It also sort of suggests a very Victorian notion of a museum where you go in one end as yourself and you come out the other end as a better person because you went through the museum. It's sort of like a cultural car wash, right? You go through it and you're better when you come out the other end. Um, I don't think there's much in this definition that the keepers of the Royal College of Surgeons Museum, which is what's in the background of this slide, wouldn't have agreed with in the 1880s, except maybe perhaps enjoyment, because there was a time when you weren't necessarily supposed to have fun in museums. It was more like a library, and you're supposed to keep quiet and understand and learn. 
I'd like to take a little closer look at some parts of this definition. So I'm just going to highlight a few things in red. And these pieces I've highlighted speak to both what museums do and what results from those actions. So I'm going to go through them one by one. So acquires. Museums acquire stuff. That's kind of baked into our baked into our DNA. We are all about collecting. Often museums are founded by collectors. Sometimes they're staffed by collectors. Sometimes they're collectors on the board. But collecting is one of the core functions of a museum. And on the right-hand side, the classic, I can't think of another exhibit topic, so I'm going to do new acquisitions uh, and put off and show off some stuff that we just acquired. So we acquire things in this world. Often the things we acquire have to be conserved, uh, both in the larger sense of preserving things from harm and in the more technical sense of fixing them up, restoring them, deacidifying them, mounting them, repairing damage, and, and so on. So we acquire, we conserve, we research, of course, because um, we are in the knowledge business, both in um, digging it up and also in presenting it. And that's an essential part of our holding of these artifacts is that we research and understand them. Uh, can't do anything if we don't communicate it. Uh, so the museum tour, uh, whether by a docent or a teacher or a curator is another classic part of what museums are seen to do. We exhibit it, of course. You can't be a museum without exhibits. For many people, this is the thing that most exemplifies what museums do. On the right-hand side, you see a very straightforward traditional indoor exhibit with stuff in glass boxes. Education, again, no museum is complete without at least one group of kids on a field trip. You can usually hear them before you can see them as they're coming through. Study, of course, in the sense of research, working with groups of students, working with emerging professionals to look more closely at what's in the collection and sometimes to come and study the work of the museum itself. And finally, of course, enjoyment because no museum is complete without enjoyment. And one of the standing jokes in the business is that if you design exhibits for kids, everybody will have a good time and no one will notice that they're designed for kids. So enjoyment is a really key part of the experience. So that's the tried and true, well-polished, brass-plated, officially endorsed view of what museums do. Uh, in January of 2019, though, uh, ICOM, the International Committee on Museums, invited its members and committees and other interested parties to take part in creating a new, more current definition. They put the word out. Um, they asked people for what they thought. They did a lot of active listening. They collected all the definitions. They collated all the new definitions coming in, set up a committee to do this. And in late 2019, oh, sorry, mid-2019 in July, they actually selected a new alternative definition of a museum that they were going to bring to a vote for their committee. And what they came up with is kind of interesting. Here's the first part. Museums are democratizing inclusive and polyphonic spaces for critical dialogue about the pasts and futures. Acknowledging and addressing the conflicts and challenges of the present, they hold artifacts and specimens in trust for society safeguard diverse memories for future generations, and guarantee equal rights and equal access to heritage for all people. There's the second part. Museums are not for profit. They're participatory, they're transparent, and they work in active partnership with and for diverse communities to collect, preserve, research, interpret, exhibit, and enhance understandings of the world, aiming to contribute to human dignity and social justice, global equality, and planetary well-being. Um, so let's look at some of those that I think are worth calling out and highlighting. This is what I'd like to look at in the first part that I showed you. And this is from the second part. So I'm just going to go through those one by one and spend a bit of time with them. You'll notice um, if you just 
compare those two definitions. The first one was very functional. It spoke mainly to what museums do. It's sort of prescriptive. In order to be a museum, you need to do the following functions, acquire, conserve, research, and so on. The newer definition still includes those aspects because it talks about collecting, preserving, researching, interpreting, and exhibiting. But it goes further because it talks about not just what museums do, but also how they should go about it. So for example, democratizing. This might mean that you're not just doing an exhibit about the history of democracy as a concept and as a political structure, but by your exhibits and your programs, you're actively working to further democracy or much more actively engaged. Museums should also be inclusive. Um, this has been a goal of ours for a long time. We've worked towards it with greater and lesser degrees of success. But this definition makes it not uh, an add-on or an option. It embeds it in the very notion of what a museum is. That's another, that's another pretty significant change. We'll now go to polyphonic. Museums are seen, whether we like it or not, as authoritative sources of knowledge. Um, we're serious, we have beautiful stuff, we have expensive stuff, we're places where people come to learn uh, the truth, which in some cases is there and in some cases is not. And all of this means that we often speak with a pretty loud voice. And one of the effects of that loud voice, intentionally or otherwise, can be to drown out other voices. It's really the music, it's a big, solid, fancy building talking full of people with PhDs and other degrees and they're scientists and researchers. And it all seems pretty heavy duty and pretty serious. But if you add a polyphony of voices in the definition, that means the museum has to be a site where other voices are heard along with its own. Sometimes it might even mean that the other voices predominate. And what the museum does is just sit quietly and listen to those other voices. So this is, again, is a real change because this is being embedded as a basic component of what makes a museum a museum. If we take that approach, then it becomes a lot easier to facilitate critical dialogue in the museum. We can move from delivering monologues, which essentially is what happens when you get that big authoritative building full of experts, to actually being places of dialogue, and not just dialogue in a sense of pleasant conversation, but critical dialogue about issues that matter. In the new definition, museums also deal with the conflicts and challenges of the present. This is a really interesting one. History, of course, is continuous. It doesn't stop and it doesn't start. It just, it just flows. But if you're going to be an engaged museum by this definition, you can not only show, say, the historical context for a current event. If you talking about labor history, you can do an exhibit about the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire and talk about some of the founding moments in labor and organized labor history. But it also means that you can take account of what's happening right outside your doors right now, as well as just providing historical context. And again, that's something that people have done sometimes in the past, but it hasn't been seen as a core function of what museums do. Museums now should guarantee equal rights and equal access to heritage for all people. This is more than it seems because of course, one reaction to this could be, well, who's against equal access? Nobody's against equal access, maybe not explicitly, but in some ways, unintentionally, yes. So access to heritage also is about a lot more than just offering free admission one evening a week. It means truly sharing the wealth of museums by resituating objects in the collection back into the cultures from which they've been taken and sequestered. It means sharing knowledge far beyond the walls of the building and the scope of a single visit. And this is an area where museums can never ever do enough. I can't imagine how you could provide too much access to what museums have and represent. Next part, museums should be participatory. Um, we're pretty good at this, but again, like access, there's always more we can do. Here's a word that's very much in the news these days, transparency. What does a transparent museum look like? Well, maybe it's one where you can find answers to questions like, who's on the board? 
Who makes decisions here? How are they selected? Could I be on the board? How does the museum decide what to collect? How does it decide what to put on exhibit? If you get feedback from community members or stakeholders, visitors, where does it go? How do you take account of it? And it would be easier rather than harder to get answers to those questions. Modern museums should work in active partnership with and for diverse communities. This is um, a really important question. And the most important part of this is the and, with and for. So that means that museums not only consult, but it's a resource. And the museum makes it possible for other groups to tell their stories through its platform. So in some cases, back to sitting and listening quietly, it's just a facilitator. It's not actually a creator or an originator, but it recognizes that it has things to offer other groups who also have stories to tell. We should be about human dignity. This again, um, you might say, well, who's against human dignity? But think about the unintended ways in which museums can work against human dignity. Who is included in the museum? Who's not? Are the people that are referred to in its exhibits and programs are presented as fully human, or are they just tropes or character types or numbers? Do museums credit to the fullest extent the emotional, artistic, and intellectual labor of everybody who contributes to its work? How does the museum treat its staff? Are they acknowledged? Are they recognized? Are they seen as part of the process? Or is it all about the director being in the news? Museums might also be involved in social justice. This is an important part of what we said before about critical dialogue about the conflicts and challenges of the present. And it's a way of ensuring that you're relevant because it's a way of ensuring that you're paying attention to what's outside your walls as well as what's inside your walls. If we look at global equality, oh, sorry. If we look at global equality, museums can use their power for good. That's a conscious choice they can make. And planetary well-being. And at this point, I can imagine some people saying, okay, now, now you're pushing it, right? That's an awfully big agenda for a local community museum. But when there's a flood on the ground floor or an empty space where the roof used to be, planetary well-being issues like climate change become a lot less abstract for museums. So there too, they have a role to play and a responsibility. So that's just a, a sort of a highlight tour of this new view of what museums can be and what they should do. Now I want to take a look at what, for many people, is what the museum is all about, and that is artifacts. Uh, if you saw the blurb for this talk, uh, I talked about museums being about stuff. Um, that's true. This is not, however, a photo of the Hamilton Civic Museum storage. It is a typical and deliberately representative photo of a typical museum storage area. And having been at a few of them over my career, I can say this is actually a pretty nice one because I've seen far worse. Researching stuff, finding it, acquiring it, preserving it, conserving it, storing it, moving it, keeping track of it, exhibiting it, and occasionally getting rid of it, occupy the time and energy and often both the dreams and the nightmares of museum staff. This is a big deal. So if you are a you might say that dealing with this history stuff is a distinctive organizational competency for museums. For all that we talk about artifacts, right, and we often speak in great terms about we're holding the future of humanity in our storerooms and this stuff is relevant and meaningful and precious and priceless, um, there are some aspects of museum collections that only get talked about in hushed whispers and not out in public too much. These are questions like, why do we have all this stuff? Do we have too much stuff? Should we get rid of some stuff? And depending on where this conversation is taking place, these questions can be seen as revolutionary, if not downright heretical in some cases. There is, I would say, an increasing awareness that museums need to do more than just put stuff on shelves, as you see here in these other storage areas. They need to, in more professional terms, 
recognize that they have obligations beyond faithful and prudent stewardship of material objects. This means that they're recognizing that having stuff is necessary, but not on its own sufficient. There's got to be more. So most museums have too much stuff. If you ask a museum if not having enough collections or not having enough artifacts is one of its key barriers to success, you will probably get a lot of no's because everybody's drowning in stuff. So we're all, from the largest to the smallest, grappling with really existential questions about the obligations, implications, and burdens of all these collections and all this stuff. For a long time in Canada, culminating uh, around the centennial in 1967, we were in what you could call the great age of acquisition, right? Everybody was collecting. Everything was at risk. It all needed to be collected. And the baseline assumption was, if some stuff was good, then more stuff was better. A lot of institutions were founded then. A lot of collections were built then. And since then, we've kind of come to the end of that era. It's not enough, we now know, to hold these objects. We also have to use them to tell stories and to create visitor experiences. And if they don't work, maybe they need to go somewhere else. In the words of a really interesting group called the Active Collections Project, who are doing some great thinking on this topic, we believe we need to stop touting the size of museum collections and start talking about impact. And more tellingly, we believe we need to change the conversation from caring for artifacts to caring about people. That's much in line, much more in line with the new definition than just talking about how precious and valuable and irreplaceable your stuff is. So our collections in Hamilton, I've come to know in the months that I've been here, are really good for um, some things. They're really good for creating period environments and furnishing historic houses, because that's a lot of what we do. That, however, means that they're kind of specialized, and they're less well-suited to other purposes, like offering insight into the city's history beyond just the museums it operates. So there's little debate that, um, in the words of the revised definition, it is the museum's role to hold artifacts and specimens in trust for society. That's not a hard question, right? We still agree that that's an important part of being a museum. The hard questions, though, are about which artifacts we hold and to what end and how many and for how long. And if a museum isn't having this conversation now, then it's late to the party and it's time to start it. So clearly, the collect it all and sort it out later approach has not been the best strategy. Think of it this way. The old question was, why shouldn't we accept this donation? And the new question is, why should we? So we're on the brink of a pretty significant era of change in how we manage our stuff. But then there's the people for whom we supposedly do this. The most important part of this museum artifacts audiences equation. Without an audience, a museum is just a pile of stuff. Um, and museum administrators and directors and staff talk a lot about the importance of audiences, but they typically mean a certain kind of importance. Because museums need their audiences for many things. They need them to visit, first of all, to become an audience. They need them to buy a membership while they're there. It'd be great if they also made a donation, either of stuff or some money in the donation box. They need them to volunteer. They need them to sign their kids up for programs. They need them, of course, to shop and eat while they're at the museum, too. They need them for all these things. These are all good for business, but they're only business, right? These are all transactional relationships that museums have with their audiences. But what about having a deeper relationship that goes beyond the conducting of business? What about a museum audience relationship that is, well, a little more relational? than transactional. If you look at this definition, it's really just a happy accident that the example here is about power. Because moving from transactional to relational necessitates considering and redistributing some of the power that you have. So if we say, well, OK, sounds interesting, clever use of words, what would this relational museum look like? And it just so happens there's a great example not too far away in Toronto at the Toronto Ward Museum. I'd like to take a look at one of their programs. They have created a program 
called Block to Block that I would suggest is truly relational. It's a participatory multimedia project that engages young people and newcomers in both the collection and interpretation of local oral history stories. They train young people to interview community members about their lived experiences, and they preserve and animate stories of migration, settlement, and civic life in Canadian immigrant neighborhoods. They focused at first on four Toronto neighborhoods. So they're looking at Agent Court, Victoria Park, Regent Park, and Parkdale. And some of the activities include training for the kids in oral history research, preserving at least 30 of the oral histories per neighborhood, working collectively to curate annual exhibits in each neighborhood about those stories, curating an online exhibit, and having block parties, because what could be more appropriate for a program called Block to Block than having block parties with more interactive programming. And the goal of all of this is to deepen relationships in and between communities through the exchange of personal stories, reflections, and resources. They also want to contribute to a better public understanding of migrant settlement experiences and to encourage public dialogue about future city building. This is important in the context of civic museums. They're actually engaging in city building. So how can museums move their relationships from visitors with visitors from being primarily transactional to being more relational? Uh, it's a big task, but we have some ideas. And by the way, this illustration of a big task in action is also one of my all-time favorite museum interactives. When you go to Stonehenge with your kids, uh, you can pull on a rope to see if your kids can quote-unquote move a fiberglass replica of one of the massive stones that make it up. A strain gauge built into the end, you can see it facing the kids there, measures the amount of pull they're exerting. I think this is great. It's relevant, it's engaging, it's interactive, and it makes children tired. But really, what more could you want from a museum experience? So if we think of the work of a museum as first and foremost, beyond anything else, creating visitor experiences, and we acknowledge that the traditional core activities, the ones the first definition spoke of, right? Acquiring, conserving, researching, communicating, exhibiting, those are all means to that end. They're not ends in themselves. There have been times in the past when they have been ends in themselves, that's over. So if we acknowledge privilege, share power and share platforms and adopt inclusion, collaboration and co-creation as core organizational values, not just things for committee to study, but things that are in the mission statement right next to excellence or maybe even replacing excellence in the mission statement. If we engage multiple voices and points of view in developing new visitor experiences, not just as audiences for them, but as co-producers of them. If we create visitor experiences that invite and reward relevant and active participation, and if we create visitor experiences that are equitable and fully accessible in all sense of the words, we'll have moved quite a ways towards taking ourselves from transactional, come spend some money and go home, to being truly relational. So great question. This all sounds fun, John, but we're in Hamilton. So what does this all mean for Hamilton? Let's have a look. We've dealt with the museum part of this, so let's look into Hamilton and Civic. See what that says. So Hamilton Civic Museums has seven places you can visit uh, and one that you can't because it's at the bottom of Lake Ontario. So the seven you can visit are Griffin House, Fieldcoat, Dundurn Castle and the Military Museum, Whitehern, Children's Museum, Steam and Technology, and Battlefield House. And without for a moment, because I know my staff are listening, without for a moment discounting the wonderful work that we do every day at these museums, I want to ask a question. What about the space in between these museums? Uh, we could have a brick and mortar museum in every corner of the city, and please note, Jason, I am not suggesting that. And even if we did, and even if we could, that still wouldn't address the city beyond our sites. Because visiting a brick and mortar museum is for the most part an interior experience. You arrive, you go in, you come out, and you leave. It's inward looking. So I think this is where a program like Block by Block can be so important. 
In this case, the museum, the Ward Museum provided the means and the platform and it shared its authority and its knowledge with co-creators who worked in their own neighborhoods, which of course occupy spaces between and around our museums, all that space the museums don't fill, to produce exhibits and events that not only explore their subjects, but do so through their own voices and in their own words. And that's back to the democratizing, inclusive and polyphonic parts of that second definition. So, Earlier on, we talked about how one of the principal differences between the old and new definitions was the proposed new definition included the traditional museum functions, but also spoke to how they do it. In the late 1980s, a sociologist named Ray Oldenburg coined the term third place in his book, The Great Good Place, which was subtitled, Cafes, Coffee Shops, Bookstores, Bars, Hair Salons, and Other Hangouts at the Heart of a Community. And his notion, was that there are three kinds of places. Your first place is your home and the people you live with. The second place is your workplace, where some of us actually probably spend more time or used to before COVID than we do at home. So home and the workplace. The third places are what he called the anchors of community life. And they facilitate and foster broader and more creative interaction. In other words, a third place is a place where you go to relax in public, where you meet familiar faces, make new friends. Uh, and the example that always gets mentioned in this context, of course, is Cheers, where everybody knows your name. Here's a thought. Could a museum that aspires to be relational and to take on the characteristics outlined in the proposed ICOM definition become a third place in a city? Let's look. Other people working in this field have summarized the characteristics of a third place. The first one they suggest is that it's, excuse me, third one, the first one is neutral ground. So people who are in third places don't have to be there. It's voluntary. They're not tied down in any way and they're free to come and go as they please. Third places are leveling. Everybody's the same. No importance on, a, on your status in society, either economic or social, doesn't matter. So there's a sense of commonality among people. We're all the same at the barbershop, right? We're all getting our hair cut. There are no prerequisites or requirements to prevent acceptance or participation in the third place. Conversation is the main activity in the third place. Playful conversation, happy conversation, spontaneous, usually lighthearted and humorous. Third places are also accessible and accommodating because nobody would go there voluntarily if they weren't. You wouldn't fight your way in if it was no fun. So they have to be open and readily accessible. They have to provide for the wants of their inhabitants and all the occupants of a third place need to feel that their needs have been fulfilled. A lot of third places have regulars, right? Again, think of cheers. Number of regulars, they give the space its tone and they help set the mood and the characteristics of the area. The regulars attract the newcomers and they're there to help somebody navigate the space and make them feel welcome and accommodated. Third places typically also have a low profile. The inside of it is not grandiose, not pompous, has a homey feel. They're never snobby or pretentious. They're accepting of all types of individuals from different walks of life. The mood is playful, just like the conversation, never tense, never hostile or confrontational. Again, people wouldn't go there if it was. And finally, and most importantly, a third place is a home away from home. That's how people describe it as feeling, right? So they'll have the same feelings of warmth, possession, belonging as they would in their own homes. They feel that a piece of themselves is rooted in that space and they get regenerated by spending time there. Um, in a Hamilton context, of course, the archetype of third places is one that is familiar to most of you. And I just wonder if it's possible for these places also to become third places. Just a question to consider. So we've looked at 
older and newer versions of what a museum is. And we've seen that the newer one includes both core functions and the nature of its visitor experiences. We talked a bit about the changing role of artifacts in museums and the importance of seeing collecting and stewardship not as ends in themselves, but as a means to the end of creating memorable and engaging visitor experiences. We looked at the relationship between museums and their audiences, an example of how museums can share their power and be co-creators. We saw that there is more history between and around Hamilton Civic Museums than there is inside them. And we thought about how our own work could embrace both our current museums and those unexplored, at least by us, spaces and more closely connect them with each other. And finally, we just talked about third places and the possibilities for audience engagement that goes much wider and deeper than traditional exhibits and programs. And think about a museum that managed on a visitor survey to be told by its visitors that it, that it achieved even half of those characteristics of a third place and how happy you would be if that's what your visitors were saying about what it was like to visit you. So when I joined the staff last December, seems like a while ago, we were in um, what we now fondly call the before times. And I just, a warning now, a triggering warning, the following photo may shock you. Look, they're close together. They're touching. There's no masks. And then of course, this happened. And some other things as well. Beginning last year before I arrived, the staff of the Heritage Resource Management section had already started um, an extensive public consultation and they were beginning to think about the results of that consultation when the pandemic broke out and the world changed. It's also not just the pandemic, it's changing our world. We're having profound, painful and long buried conversations that have been brought into the open now. Things we never talked about in public or almost never talked about in public are now part of our everyday conversation. We know from what I've told you this afternoon and from the results of our public consultations that people now expect more of museums than ever before, and rightly so, I might add. These things about, well, is that something we could do in the future? Might be a direction we want to go. I think those have become now not a topic for leisurely conversation, but an urgent reality that we need to address. So in the coming months, the Civic Museums will continue the conversation we've already begun amongst our skilled and passionate staff, which is looking into all of the things that I've shared with you today. Exhibits, collections, programs, digital engagement, audiences. Before the end of this year, we're going to re-engage with all of you, our visitors and residents and professional colleagues to continue this conversation and we'll see where it goes. So thank you for um, joining us. And as Sylvia mentioned, if you have questions and haven't already sent them in, you can email them to pedtalk at hamilton.ca. And now I believe it's question time. Where's my moderators? I was muted. Thanks, John. There you are. Hello, Sylvia. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, so awesome. just a correction for the email. It's P ped talks with an S so at hamilton.ca. My apologies. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> so we already have some questions that have come in. Sure. Which is perfect. And if anybody has any additional ones, please feel free to send them in and we will do our best to answer them. Um, as much as possible. Great. So our first question for John, um, which city of Hamilton Civic Museums are currently open? And are there any safety measures in relation to COVID-19 currently in place to keep everybody safe? Uh, good question, uh, one that has a good answer. So on July 15th, uh, we opened, we reopened three museums, Dundurn Castle, the Hamilton Military Museum, and the Hamilton Museum of Steam and Technology. And we chose those for several reasons, um, but mostly because uh, if you consider that all the guidelines that the province and the city and the Department of Health have put out, we felt that those three museums were the ones that could most easily accommodate all of the new restrictions and regulations about distancing and separate entrances and exits and daily and hourly and more frequent cleaning. So we have in order to do this we have rethought our tours we've limited the number we've limited the frequency uh, 
we are now, of course, working with everybody else now that the mask uh, bylaw has come into effect and outdoor and sorry, indoor public place masking is mandatory in Hamilton. Our, I have to say our visitors have stepped right up and been wonderful about this. Uh, we're having people purchase tickets online only so that we can control both the numbers on any given tour and the number of people on site at any one time. And once again, people have been really understanding. You can still use your Hamilton library card to come to the museum, to the, the museums, but we also ask you to still reserve a ticket online so that we can track the numbers. Um, our staff are learning how to give tours and masks. It's been an interesting process. And at the end of each week that we're open, we're having a little meeting and looking at what worked and what didn't work and what could work better the next week. And once the external situation changes again, we will also adapt ourselves uh, once again to our new reality. But we're delighted to be open, at least in, in part, and it's great to see visitors again. Next question. And this question is from Douglas Wartz. If Douglas museums Wartz. Hello, Douglas Wartz. Shout out to Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, if museums want to become catalysts that engage the public in the process of continuous cultural adaptation within a world that is changing very fast, what do they need to do less of and what new skills do they need to acquire and activities they need to experiment with? Excellent question. Um, I've heard it said before that um, you know, museums can interpret the 19th century, but they really don't do business in the 19th century. Uh, and if anything, as mostly as nonprofits, it's really important for museums to be crisp and nimble and focused and responsive. And if you think about it, those are all characteristics of startups, right? They're, they're staffed by passionate people who believe strongly in what they do. They're willing to be flexible. They're willing to fail and fail and fail again. They don't see that as a drawback. They see it as an asset. They're thinking all the time about their customers, about people's needs and wants and how they can satisfy them. Those are things that happen in some areas of the museum. They sometimes happen in the education department. They happen less frequently, I would suggest, in the curatorial department or in the management office. So the culture of a museum has to support the direction it wants to go. So you can't adopt that new ICOM definition and stick it up on the wall in the lunchroom and say that your work is done. If those things aren't in the bylaws, if they aren't in the mission statement, if the board doesn't discuss them all the time, then they won't become real. It'll just fall away and not be honored. So you need to make this change permanent. And although it sounds like the wrong way to say it, I think it works. You need to institutionalize a willingness to change and adapt and be aware of what's going on around you. You have to build it and bake it right into the structure, or otherwise it'll just be the initiative of a couple of independent staff people who won't necessarily get the support they need. So the whole place has to stand up and recognize what's going on and commit to dealing with it. That's a big project, and the bigger the ship, the longer it takes it to turn. But it's also, I think, not an option. That is really the only project that's in front of us now. If you look at a museum blog online, every single topic is about what next? How do we reopen? What's the new reality? What does it mean for us? How do we do business in a new reality? This has been brought, sort of brought to a head by COVID. It was starting before, but it's going a lot faster now. Thank you. And next question is also from Douglas Wards. How can museums better develop the skills to identify and address the changing needs and opportunities of living cultures? at levels like individuals, groups, communities, cities, countries, social, economic, government systems, et cetera, in a world that is constantly changing? There are um, models of practice and communities of practice outside the walls of museums that have a lot to offer people who work in museums. Um, and many of these have the advantage of being thought up by really smart people who spent a lot of time evolving them. So methodologies like design thinking, like human-centered design, processes to start with empathizing. That's a different place to start. Start with empathizing, with understanding your audience. Um, those have a lot to offer. Practices like community organizing, right? What is, what is the first principle of community organizing? You go meet people where they live. You don't wait for them to come to you. 
that's a big change as well. It's like, sure, we can do a program, but you have to get on the subway or a bus or your whole class has to come down to see it. That may not be the best way for us to do business anymore because our audience is out there. They're in their own places, which again is why something like that Ward Museum program is so amazing um, because they it happened out in the neighborhood. People were talking about their own context and sharing it with others. It wasn't the museum initiating it. It was the museum supporting it. So that's part of that nimbleness and flexibility and a lot of it just comes down to to letting go right letting go of control being willing to venture out being will being willing to not have all the answers being willing to sit and listen uh, and engage in a really deep and meaningful way that probably won't go the way you think it will and a recognition on the part of the leadership that that's okay not a problem it's actually an asset. So it's part of that culture change again about what the proper work of museum consists in because it surely isn't just getting more stuff. We've done that, right? And we have lots of stuff. So what's next? And I think what we've been talking about today is the what's next part. Next question is from Justice Stacy. In response to the idea that museums should react to and engage in conflicts and disrupt disruptions of the present, how does this play out differently in regards to institution size? I have worked with big and small cultural spaces and the small ones have a huge advantage of staffing, of small staffing and quick turnover of exhibits. I find bigger ones cannot respond so quickly in their physical spaces. John, how do you suggest larger institutions address this, pro this problem? Um, that's also a really good question. And it seems, I, I think the main thing that distinguishes museums from each other is not their subject matter, but their size. It's really different to work in a big place than a small place. So I think a small paleontology museum and a small art museum have more in common with each other than a small paleontology museum and a large paleontology museum because the whole place changes. So what makes it work at these place, small places? First of all, it's necessity. <laughs> You know, something's broken, it needs to be fixed, you fix it because there's, you can't make a phone call. There's nobody else to call. It's you and you need to step in and do it. So people tend to be um, more polyvalent in their skills and abilities. They're of necessity forced to work together as a team because there might only be three of them on duty. There's no room for bureaucracy in a three person team. Um, and you deal with it as it comes and often you don't have the resources so you can't misspend money that you don't have right so there's no possibility of doing a big expensive failure project because you don't have the money to spend so right away you're thinking flexibly you're thinking about repurposing uh, innovating working collaboratively to take advantage of somebody else's equipment so those are again all habits of mind and practice and you might not get everybody at a big institution working that way, but you can create pockets, you can create places where that happens and the leadership can give permission for that to happen. Because again, it's gonna be bumpy, it's going to be awkward, and some of it's not going to work. And if you have a very traditional results-based focus, those are gonna look like failures. And of course, they're anything but failures. I think it was a couple of years ago, the federal government, and maybe it's still going on, actually brought in hackers and they set them up hackers and game designers and they set them up in an office in ottawa in a federal building because they wanted to know how they get their results they wanted some of what they do some of what those workplaces have as a culture to seep out into a larger and much more slow moving organization i think that was a fascinating experiment and maybe they should do the same with people from small museums like people from community museums might have some stuff to share with the government as well. So it's looking, I think, for opportunities to, to let that culture flourish. And in some cases, all you have to do is stand back and let it go and just get out of the way. And I say that as a somebody in a leadership position too. Sometimes it's already there. It's just can't get out because it's locked in a room. So you unlock the door and stand back and, and see what happens. Our next question is from Sarah Wayland. It's a two-part question. What process what process will the city use to consider new ideas for creating third spaces? And are you open to hearing some pitches? Uh, yes, to the second one, absolutely yes. And that's, and that's part of it, just, just being open and leaving the door open. We're, um, I, I set up a, a project a 
couple months ago where we have some very small staff teams who are each working on a distinct area and they are researching it, thinking about it, and then bringing it back to the larger group. And then out of that, we're going to be identifying what might be some of the most profitable ways for us to go. And I mentioned at the end of the actual talk that we were looking at re-engaging uh, to follow on the engagement work that we did um, last year. Last year uh, it was run by consultants. I think we might actually tackle this one ourselves because we need to be there and sit um, and listen and hear. So we can't do what is going to be effective and what people want us to do unless we, um, you know, go out and talk to them. Um, it's very difficult to solve a problem or address an issue if you don't know what the issue is or if you're guessing what the issue is. So. How do you do that? You go ask the person who has the issue, what's what's the issue? What do you think we should be doing? And then you make good on your promise. That's the most important part, right? You can't do all of this and then write it up as a study and put it in a binder and leave it on the shelf. It has to become what and how you do. So people need to see it being taken seriously. And so the early adopters, right? The ones who are brave enough to step forward and say, could you help us with this? And they're willing to be at risk and do that. And if you help them, people go, oh, you know what? They're serious. They're actually serious about this. They're serious about reaching out. They're serious about engaging and about thinking in a different way. And so maybe we'll step forward too and get involved with them. And that's how it starts. And that's how the word on the street changes. So it doesn't happen very fast, but people watch and people pay attention, not just to what you say, but how you do business. So it's back to this corporate culture thing again, about what people feel they can and can't do as staff what they get rewarded for, what kind of behavior gets noticed and commended. And we can make all of those changes because that's under our control. We can control the environment we all work in. And, and our yes, next we're looking for your ideas. Please <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> and our next question is from Kat Williams. What role does digital space play in museums moving in these directions that you're talking about? Um, a big one. Um, and I can say that because we don't really have one yet. Um, in the early days of digital, of course, it was just like the early days of computers. I have a computer at home. I don't know what to do with it. I will put my recipes on the computer. That wasn't really a fulsome use of what that space could offer you. Um, we all went through a period of putting images of our artifacts online. And I guess that was better than what was there before. But it wasn't really speaking to the strengths of that digital space as a medium. And that's what we're all now beginning to truly understand is what does it look like to have an experience that was made from the outset to be a digital museum experience, not just something that's been translated from a different medium. Um, there's some really interesting work going on with uh, people participating in history online. There's museums that are opening stuff up online to help uh, people dive into parts of the museum they could not be in before. I mean, you'll never, you can never run a hundred person tour of storage. It just won't work. The spaces won't support it. The conservator will kill you, but you can run a 10,000 person tour of your collection online. You can let people metaphorically take things off the shelf, set them side by side, arrange them in a way that makes sense to them. And then they can share that with other people that can't happen in a gallery. It can happen in a digital space. There are sites that by their very nature can only ever have so many people go through them. There are distinct physical limitations. So some people can enjoy it that way. A much larger audience though can participate online. We have museums, we can make good use of technology. We're generally two or three or four years out there after it's been developed. So we're not really pushing the envelope. So we just look at off the rack stuff. There are so many things that we can put to our advantage to share our experiences more broadly um, and to offer people insights into what we do and how we do it and to offer people platforms. Also, again, it's a lot easier to give them web space than it is to give them gallery space of which we only have so much. And given that, given that brick and mortar exhibits are probably the most expensive means ever developed to communicate, it's a lot more nimble and easy and flexible to do it on the web. So we're looking forward to doing that in a more meaningful way. And that's certainly part of what we're considering right now. Great, thanks, John. So that brings us to the end of our question and answer period. I know we're running a little bit over time and there's still a lot of questions that we've received. So thank you for that. And uh, I will share those with John for, uh, for follow-up. 
And so we'll this brings us. We'll look at a way to um to get those answers back out to people too. Absolutely. Okay. So this brings us to the end of our PED talk. I would like to thank our speakers today, Jason Thorne and John Summers. Thank you both for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us and your preparation for this thought provoking and informative PED talk event. Thank you to everyone who's participated. You've all been a great audience. At the end of the session, there will be a short survey for the audience to fill out. If you could take a moment, please, to fill out your thoughts and suggestions, they'll be valuable for future feedback of planning these future events. So now I'm going to pass it over to Jason for closing off our PED talk. I'm here, but my camera seems to be locked. Oh, there we go. Uh, thanks, Sylvia, and uh, and thanks, John. That was uh, that was fascinating. I, I learned welcome. a great deal, and 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 will now forever look at museums very differently than I did before. <laughs> I'm a great fan of that uh, Third Places book that you referenced. It's one of my favorites. Um, I think I read it through the lens of sort of city planning and urban planning, and now reading it through the lens of of um, of history and heritage is is uh, it, it it was very eye opening for me. So thanks for that. And thanks I used everybody to hang for out with a lot of planners, and I think it worked its way into my thoughts. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so thanks everybody for uh, for taking part. Um, we will be hosting more PED talks in the future. Um, hopefully back to being in person, but if not, we will try another uh, virtual one. And uh, and as always, if people have suggestions for topics, uh, please don't hesitate to send them my way. Um, you can send them to Sylvia at that email address that was up earlier. Um, we're always looking for for new ideas. So. Thank you very much. Thanks again, John. One more question, Sylvia, where can people get access to the recording of this talk? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so this recording uh, will be shared with everybody who's registered. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, John. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now. Bye.